All right. Okay. All right, guys, give me your attention. Uh, you're going to love the, uh, the message today. You're going to learn a lot because when I have questions, I mean, so I, I have a PhD in theology from South Africa. So does this other guy you're going to hear from today. But when I have questions about the nature of God, I go to this guy. And we've had several Zoom calls just in the, in the last few months um, as I've prepared for different projects because I want to hear what this guy says. And who is this guy? Dr. Lauren Pankratz, mm -hmm. and he started a church here to reach Mormons, and he's, he's reaching them on, on the street, but he's also doing academic work that's uh, really, um, really fantastic, top-level stuff. So please welcome Dr. Lauren Pankratz. All right, well, thanks for uh, coming. First of all, I just want to say thank you to you guys for coming here to Utah on uh, your is it summer break right now. Using your summertime to come up into Utah, man, I really respect that and I appreciate that. Um, that's how I ended up here. So I was on a mission trip, um, meeting a group of, uh, of students here to reach LDS folks, and uh, and the Lord just sort of used that time of, uh, of reaching into the culture here to show me the need and to show me uh, and to kind of push me to engage uh, more permanently because we're we're doing a couple weeks out of the year bringing bringing students out. And, uh, and just felt like, man, I think that the Lord actually wants to reach these people that are here. There's not a lot of people reaching them. And, um, and I don't think a couple weeks out of the year is going gonna, is gonna to change the spiritual landscape. And so we kind of figured out um, that probably a better strategy is going to be planting churches. And so planting a church here um, in Centerville, we launched our church April 3rd, 2011. And there was no other evangelical church here. In Centerville, when we did that, there was no evangelical church in Farmington to our north or to our southwest, Bountiful and Woods Cross. Um, no Christian churches in any of those cities there. And so, um, and there's a lot more places like that in Utah where you have city after city after city with no Christian influence. And so uh, just a, a really interesting environment here uh, in terms of church planting. And I didn't have necessarily a huge heart for the Mormons. Um, I had a huge heart for an incredibly lost place in America. I thought, this is crazy that in America you would have a place where in Centerville, where we live right now, where you're at right now, there are less people in a Christian church worshiping. And the next closest state in terms of like dismal church, Christian church attendance is Nevada at uh, about 9%. So you think of, when you think of like, where's the least godly place you think of we think of las vegas or we think of maybe nevada's out there um nine percent of the of the state is in a christian church on sunday morning utah is a whole three percent so we're like a third of like the one that we usually would think of would not be so great and then here in centerville south davis county we're about one percent uh same thing with provo uh kind of near byu it's that another percent like that anyway i tell you that because um i'm grateful that you're here I'm grateful that Christians are taking an interest in reaching people for Christ here in Utah, and um, and so I'm. Uh, that's what that's what brought me here. Gabriel in the back. Um, I don't know how many of you guys know Gabriel or not, but he's the same story. He and I both uh, at different times in different ways uh, were brought to Utah to reach people for Christ, and it happened through mission experiences like the one that you guys are on right now. So I would um, tell you. Also, that as you leave from here, you go back home to keep Mormonism on your mind. Pray for us out here. Pray for the ministry here in Utah. And if you ever get interested in having a longer kind of cross-cultural ministry experience and you want to connect with a church over the summer for an internship or something like that and just find ways to serve here in Utah, um, please, I'd love for you to reach out and let us know. We'd love to talk with you about that. We have an intern right now who that's that was her story and we had her last summer that that was her story she was here on a mission trip got kind of a, a heart to see the spiritual landscape change and wanted to be a part of that and so uh contacted us and we were able to work out 
and internship. So uh, we'd love to chat with you as you uh, go through your, your schooling and all that. Uh, if at any time you're interested in that, please reach out. We'd love to, we'd love to chat with you. So um, I have a lot of stuff that I want to share. I don't know what you guys have already learned or gone through. So I told Tim, uh, I know he does a good do job getting you guys trained up. If I'm doing stuff that's this old hat that you guys have already gone through 10 times, just, you know, I don't know, someone give me the signal, like, you know, calling in the third baseman or, you know, the new pitcher, you know, just sort of, <laughs> some sort of baseball sign, and I'll just kind of move on to something else. But I have a lot of stuff that, that I want to do. There's some very practical stuff I want to give to you guys if you haven't already done it. I want to give you some practical stuff, but I also have a couple, uh, like um, Tim mentioned, I have some academic interests that might be um, that might be worth walking through with you guys too. So we'll just kind of see how, uh, how things go. Um, this is the question that I always like to ask people. You guys have probably wrestled with this. But when you typically, when you or your friends get together and you talk about religion or you talk about your faith, or, what would you say people would say the typical re responses that either you or your friends would give to the question, why are you a Christian? I'm assuming you're Christian here. You're here on a mission trip to reach Mormons, you're probably Christian. Um, if that's the case, why would you say you're Christian? What's the t what, what kind of answers would your friends give? What kind of answer would you give to a question like that? Yeah. Yeah, if we're playing Family Feud, that's like the number one, that's the number one answer. You grew up in a family who was Christian, took you to church, you went to VBS, you're a Christian, you know. Um, my, uh, my youth pastor, you know, his son, uh, grew up with his son a little bit. His son was, was like always a little bit irritated that when people would give their testimony and, you know, people would have crazy testimonies. His testimony was he gave his life to Jesus with a hand puppet at VBS one year. And he was like, that's, that's my big story, <laughs> you know? Uh, just sort of funny. But you just kind of grow, if you grow up in it, it's just assumed and yeah, family. What else? What else would people say? Any other ideas? Why do people, why are, why are, why are you a Christian if that's not your story? Uh, is there another story that we tell? Well, I mean, I would just say that Christianity is the truth. Okay, yeah, that's the right answer, <laughs> if you think about it. But, but yeah, I think that that's where we want to get. Uh, maybe some of you, this is my wife's story. A friend invited her to church. Uh, says my, invited me to church. It's a little bit sleepy making that. A friend invited me to church, right? Someone invited you. you got, maybe you had a religious experience with Jesus. You know, had some kind of, we had a gal at our church uh, not too long ago who, um, that was kind of her, uh, her story. So people have different things. And so the question then is, why is your friend a Mormon? You've got a Mormon friend you're talking with, or maybe it's a missionary at Temple Square you're chatting with. Why are they a Mormon? And um, the, the, the interesting thing is the answers aren't going to be all that different, right? What, what would you say? I uh, grew up in the Mormon church. Yeah. Same kind of answers that you do. I just, my family grew up with it. The same reason why if you grew up in Islamabad, most likely, initially, you would be Islam, uh, Islamic. Uh, if you grew up in predominantly Christian areas, you're going to be Christian. If you grow up in a predominantly uh, Mormon area, you're going to be Mormon. Because we have, and this is, good, this is good for us, this is survival, we need to trust our parents. If we can't trust our parents, you're going you're gonna, to you know, die of starvation or whatever. You know? um, we need to be able to trust our parents. Our parents aren't trying to deceive us. We know that. Our parents love us. They're interested in us. And so they're not going to intentionally lead us into wrong things. Okay? So we get that. But the problem is, uh, both Islam and Christianity and Mormonism, they can't all be right. It's possible that they could all be wrong, but they can't all be right. right? And so the real question is um, uh, what we said over here, what, which is at some point, yeah, you grow up just sort of, you know, drinking in the religious sentiments of your parents. But at some point, you have to kind of figure out how to make your faith your own. And the way you make your faith your own is when you when you stop believing it because mom and dad tell me, or because it's you know that's the church I grew up in, and when you come to understand that the church is true, that Christianity is true, that that Jesus is the savior of the world, and all that all of that you know comes in, all of, there's no play with that. When you come to believe, so how do we come to believe something like that? What would you say? How does that step? That step away from, I believe it, kind of riding on the coattails of my parents' faith to like having a personal faith. What would that look like for, uh, for some of us? 
How do we do that? Yeah. You have to objectively evaluate your beliefs. Absolutely. How do we do that, though? Um, look at different sources of evidence, different outside evidence is reliable. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Is the it, you might ask that question? Is the Bible reliable? Is this a reliable spiritual guide? Okay. What else? It's also an intentional act. Instead of just kind of going with the flow mm. of your family, it's a personal. Yeah, how many of you guys here have been baptized? Most of you, right? Baptism is that uh, a great expression of that. When, you, when you're when uh, you old enough and you can sort of say, no, this faith is not just my parents, but this is my faith now, right? For me, anyway, I can't say it for everybody. For me, that was a big moment. When I grew up in a Christian home. My, my dad, choir director my whole life. He was a pastor when I was really, uh, uh, before I was born as a little kid. Um, or or uh, when I was about one, I think, anyway, but... Always around the church, everything. So it was natural, but I didn't get baptized until um, going into my senior year of high school. And part of that was this faith is my own now. It's not just what I just grew up. And that, and that, uh, yeah, is the Bible reliable? Is is um, uh, is did Jesus rise from the dead? Like if he didn't rise from the dead, then no matter how much faith my parents have in the guy, he's dead and gone and whatever else. Anyway, there's a lot of things we can talk about. Um, maybe you had a missionary contact. Maybe you had a religious experience with the Book of Mormon. Have you guys had a, a Mormon person tell you um, that you need to pray and ask God if it's true? Yeah. Right. If you if you if you haven't had a Mormon tell you that yet, you haven't had a conversation with a Mormon about spiritual things yet, because that's their go-to. Right. You have a religious experience. So for them, they grow up in the church. They're baptized when they're eight. But really, they're kind of I had to believe this for myself happens when they go on their mission, typically. They go on their mission, they have to go to the missionary training center, and they have to be able to tell other people that they had the religious experience, um, that they're gonna tell people they need to pray about the Book of Mormon and ask if it's true. So they need that, they need that, they need that, uh, that experience. And so um, it's interesting sometimes to really press and probe people on that experience because a lot of times um, they know they're supposed to have it, and so they say that they have it, and then as you talk about it, it kind of gets a little bit more wishy-washy as they go. All right. Um, but anyway, uh, religious experience, um, the, the family experience, they were invited or pressed into it by a missionary or something. Those are the common kind of things. And they're not, I guess what I wanted to help emphasize is it's not that different than most of us. Um, we happen to come from a tradition uh, that's true. And so we have truth on our side, and that helps, right? But they uh, come from a position of thinking that they do. And so we're kind of in this interesting situation now where we need to try to, how do I then convince somebody who thinks they have the truth? This is what's interesting about ministry here in Utah. Um, they're not unchurched. They're wrong churched. How do we help them come to a saving relationship with Jesus? Uh, I'm not going to get into this very much here, but we could ask the question, um, what is Mormonism? I do use the term Mormonism intentionally instead of LDS because uh, there's more people that trace their faith roots <coughs> to Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon than just the LDS church. And most of what we're going to talk about today applies to all those. There's over 100 splinter groups. I don't know. Do you know how many? A lot. Over 100 splinter groups for sure that trace their lineage back to Joseph Smith and uh, – and would, would, would hold on to that term Mormon, even if they're not part of the LDS church. So the LDS church is the one that's headquartered here in Salt Lake. They have the President Nelson as their prophet, but there's a lot of other uh, Mormon groups that have a different person that they claim and hold on to as prophet and all of that. So most of what we're talking about today will apply to all of those different groups, and so I don't want to simply talk about the LDS church, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I want to broaden a little bit more to Mormonism more broadly, those groups, all those groups that trace their lineage back to Joseph Smith and uh, back to uh, uh, his, uh, the Book of Mormon and the things that he, that he came up with. So things to understand about Mormonism, first of all, it's a restorationist movement. What does that mean? Anyone know what a restorationist movement is? Somebody says that. Yeah. What's that? You do it over. It's doing it over. It's, it's yeah. Um, it's go, it's trying to get back to something. It says that there was something original, and we're trying to get back to that. So their idea is that Christianity started off great with Jesus and the like, 
uh, after Jesus and the apostles died, it just fell. It just fell into pieces, and there was nothing left of uh, like we talked about. The Bible gets corrupted. Spiritual authority or priesthood, as they call it, was all lost. And so they're trying to get back to recover the original Bible and spiritual authority that was lost. So that's a restorationist movement. There's a whole host of restorationist movements that got started around in, in the 19, uh, 19th century. Um, Joseph Smith and his group is one of them. They were uh, proved to be one of the more successful ones. But it's a restorationist movement. Um, That's a question they, I have real quick. Yep. Um, so if I'm, a, if I'm a Mormon, I said you also went through that. Um, it was a reformation, but you were trying to do a restoration. Yeah. Um, a reformation is different. Yeah. So Reformation and Restoration are, are two different ideas, and I, I guess that's the, the, the use of clarifying the term. A Reformation, you're, you're trying to maybe um, pare away some things that were added to reform some, some things. A Restoration is, is a, it's a, it's a, um, a more wholesale, the whole thing is corrupt, and we've just got to go back in time, and here's, here's, the, here's what you actually need. The, the Reformers held on to a lot of, in the, in the 1500s, the reformers held on to a lot of Christian history. They didn't reject Nicaea, they didn't reject um, the uh, uh, fundamental councils and creeds and things of the church. They held on to a lot of that stuff, but they were trying to pare away some things that had been you know, uh, added on. So they are reforming, which is different than a restoration, which is a wholesale, the whole thing's corrupt, and there's nothing to be reformed. We've just got to abandon it and start something new that goes back to the original. So it's a little bit more um, hardcore in terms of the change that gets uh, uh, necessitated because of how, how corrupt they think things got. Uh, another kind of key of Mormonism is that the heavens are open. They believe God is still speaking uh, revelatory information today. Yeah, specifically, mostly through Joseph Smith uh, and his time period, but still today, they think that the heavens are open and God continues to speak through, typically through the prophet, and then God will then, they say, uh, people will be able to ask God if what the prophet says is true, and he'll affirm that to them. It's just kind of this like self-referential system that goes on and on. So they have ongoing revelation. They have their standard works, which, um, anyone know the four standard works? Scriptures of Mormonism, what are those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. KJV Bible. Okay. That's one of the four standard works. A bunch of Mormon, yeah. Doctrine and Covenants. I mean, covenants. 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 <laughs> covenants. <laughs> oh, great. Christ. Yeah. So those, those are all um, things, and they do have, uh, their f hand is on all of them. Even though they use the King James Version, Joseph Smith um, made... Uh, some augmented uh, scripture points. He changed some things around. So you look up Romans 4.16 in the Bible, and you look up Romans 4.16 in the Mormon Bible, and it'll have a little note that says, if you want to really understand what Romans 4.16 says, you need to understand what Joseph Smith said it, originally said. So it kind of, he, he goes in and fixes it, right? But by fixes it, I mean uh, completely alters it. And same thing with Genesis 50. He adds a bunch of stuff in there. So lots of things he adds in there. Um, and then lastly, this idea of eternal progression. Who can define eternal progression for me? You want to have a, a, a briefing on what Mormon, um, what Mormons mean there? Yeah. So like after death, they go to the spirit prison or spirit paradise, face judgment, and then they'll go to the kingdoms. Yeah, uh, that's, that's right. And if they get to the highest kingdom, then they can have spirit children who they'll have the same relationship with their spirit children that you have with your heavenly father today. Right, so they believe they can become um, gods and perpetuate all that. So you kind of have this um, this kind of movement that that they believe that people are eternal intelligences. That's what they call like um, in the in, in the before the premortal state when you're birthed in the premortal world with uh, with God and, and apparently there's a heavenly mother and a heavenly father who somehow bring uh, these eternal intelligences and are able to mold them into uh, spirit beings in the pre-mortal existence. Uh, but then you move from that pre-mortal existence through the second estate, which is, a, which is mortality, where you're tested. And as you're tested through that, um, like you said, you, you, uh, you go to either paradise or prison. And even there, there's some room for, 
for some change they believe, right, with missionaries going and from Spirit Paradise going into Spirit Prison and you know, helping people if they've had vicarious works done for them, like their temple works and marriages and things and baptisms, then they can get to a, a better level of glory. And if you get that highest level, you then have spirit children that then you that you can then craft from these eternal intelligences, then you're able to mold them with your uh, eternal family. Uh, into your eternal family and, and go through all that whole thing with them. So it's just kind of this self-perpetuating um, cycle. So the question is, um, how are we going to reach them? So here's my uh, my sort of um, way I, I see this happening, especially in terms of a conversation and an experience that you're going to have the conversation with them at some point with, with LDS people. Um, the first thing is you want to get to a place where they can appreciate that um, their religion is not like yours. That they have a different God, a different gospel, a different Jesus. That we can see that they're not Christian in terms of the way that we would uh, define through the Bible what Christian is. Now, I think that they know this, but it's highly offensive to them to think that we think that. All right. um, and it shouldn't be. Has anyone had this experience where the, a, a Mormon tells you, we're, we're, we're Christian too? Right. How do you respond to that? How have you responded to that yet? Does that make me a Mormon? Okay, that's that's that, that could be one way to uh, ex explain it. What else? What do you mean by Christian? Okay, that's a great question. Defining Christian, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's essential. We need to define Christian, and that's where the rubber's going to meet the road. Um, because I like to explain to them, you know, when I was in college, I had to go to a, a, as a religious studies major. We went to a a lot of different churches and we go interview the spiritual leaders of, the, of that group and we went, I went to a, a Hindu church service and the guy behind him had a picture of Jesus and a, and a picture of his spiritual guru on the other side of him and after the service I had a conversation and I asked why do you have those two pictures and he says well I think that these are both these were both avatars of Vishnu and he says I follow Jesus's ethic I read the New Testament I believe the New Testament. I believe what what, what it says Jesus said and taught. Um, and here's a person who, like me and like my Mormon friend, would affirm that Jesus walked on water, would affirm that Jesus turned water into wine, uh, would affirm that he, that he said the things he did at the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but we're not all Christian, are we? And, would the, and the Mormon wouldn't even, would, would agree with me that we would say, well, this Hindu person is not, Christian, they're Christian if you de if you define Christianity very narrowly as someone who believes Jesus did the things like you know turned water into wine and taught so on the mount. If that's all you need to be a Christian, then there's a lot of Islamic people that are Christian, a lot of Hindus that are Christian, and that word basically comes to lose any meaning whatsoever. By Christian, um, that's not what we mean. And so and so what what we what we need to say is yeah we agree on certain things that happened in that three year period maybe of Jesus's life. But maybe the more critical thing for what makes a Christian a Christian is what Jesus was doing before that and what Jesus was doing after that. Like that's where the radical differences occur is what we think Jesus was doing before uh, the, the, the time where he was doing all those things and what he's doing now. And uh, that's where historic Christianity has very different beliefs than Mormonism regarding uh, that, that touch, what we believe about God, what we believe about salvation, what we believe about eternal life and all of that and so um, and so trying to help trying to help the Mormon kind of get a sense of that we have a different gospel um, and that we have a different God we have a different gospel and, and that's important because uh, can someone turn if you've got a Bible with you Galatians 1 8 9 you're probably familiar with this passage but uh, incredibly important passage if we can get to a point and maybe if we get a chance at the end we can talk more about this but if we get to the point where we can dive into this a little bit deeper um, we need to help the LDS person see that there is a difference here between our, our view of God and theirs, um, and, and then our view of the gospel and theirs. So does someone have Galatians 1, 8, 9, can read it? Yeah. yeah. Um, but thou, the born angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, then let him be accursed. Okay, so it's... This is a should be a troubling passage. If they have a gospel, and we have a different gospel than them, one of us, according to this passage, is accursed. 
Um, and so now we need to ask that, the question, which I want to focus our time on, uh, the next major question is then, if we, have, if we both have a gospel, they're different, and one of us is a curse, how do we go about deciding which one? How, how do we go about figuring out which one is the one that, that, is, uh, that should be followed so that we're not in spiritual jeopardy here? And there's a lot of reasons why we should uh, doubt Joseph Smith and should uh, instead trust the New Testament. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then, and then the last thing is uh, we also need to get good kind of following that, not to just end in despair, but really good at learning how to, how to speak the gospel to Mormons. Speaking the gospel to Mormons is, uh, is a difficult, uh, can be a very difficult thing because, here's the, here's the, um, in terms of how we talk about theology with a Mormon, if we, were to, if we were to kind of put up here this Venn diagram, Mormonism and Christianity, and you're going to ask, theologically, what's, what do we hold in common? What is in common theologically with a Mormon? What would we put in there? You want to know? Like terminology. <coughs> yeah. That's actually all we have in common. We just have words. We use the same words to talk about theology that they use. But every one of those words is different. And this is why communicating the gospel is difficult. You know, it'd be like, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're going to go to, let's say, a place in inland China where they speak um, you know, Mandarin, and you run in there and try to speak English to communicate the gospel. Why would that make any sense? They'll hear the gospel, they'll hear the words that you're saying, right? But, the, but it's not going to mean the right things to them. And there's kind of a similar problem that we have, as is if we just go in and break, bust open the four spiritual laws, or we just talk about you need to be saved from your sins, um, you know, you need to trust in Jesus, and we just kind of run into those things, they're going to hear all the things that we're saying, but they're not going to hear it rightly. They're going to hear it through kind of a, um, a, a Mormon dictionary, theological dictionary that they grew up with, that's going to make them not be able to hear what you're saying well. And so this is why this gets to be uh, a difficult task here, because you can use the same words, but they mean something different to them. And so they can say something like, a Mormon can, full, full, being fully sincere, can say, I believe in, in um, the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that by faith in him, he gives me the grace to receive eternal life. <coughs> they, could, they could just, and you, and you listen, every single word that I just said means something different to them. And that's why communicating the gospel is difficult, because we've got to get through that language gap, that language barrier. And that's hard. It's hard to do. That's one of the things that <coughs> take you the longest time in, in a real conversation with a Mormon is helping them uh, get through that language gap to actually hear the gospel. Because if we just use the same words that we always use, then we're just going to get, um, they're going to hear it the same way they've always used those words through that Mormon lens, and they won't actually hear the gospel. Right? But, but, um, but Romans, uh, let's go back to that. Real quick. Romans 10, 14 and 15. Someone else, just, let's just turn to that. Someone else have Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. It's a good thing is you guys, just, as you preach the gospel, your feet are beautified. You're a man of your pedicure. <laughs> pedicure of the spirit, right? As you guys get to go out. What is it, what's the, the chain then? How is it that people come to believe and put their faith in the gospel? How does it work? What's the first thing they need? They need, they need to be able to hear it, right? But if, they're, if we're just using the same words they've always used, they'll interpret it wrongly. They're not going to be hearing the gospel. And so if, if we as missionaries are kind of trying to reach people that have a different theological vocabulary, we've got to learn how to speak that language so that we can communicate the gospel clearly. 
Okay, so those are kind of the things. We have to, first of all, and, and one and three are kind of linked because we have to be able to get to a point where, where they can see and we can see that we have a different gospel. Um, from there, we need to see, okay, we've got a choice now. Let's make sure that we have reasons to reject one and believe the other. And then we also need to be good at when that's over, that we don't just lead someone into atheism, but we need them to be able to hear the gospel and understand it, how to, how to put faith in Jesus. So I'm going to hit on that second piece real quick. That second piece was, again, we want to help them to see the difference, um, but then we want to help them identify reasons why they should reject the one and, um, and then accept the other. And so we're going to get a couple reasons. Doubting Joseph's men. There's a lot of ways that you could run this. And a lot of it is um, the more you know of different things about how to get at this, You'll, there'll be different times. It's not a one size fits all. There's different times when different people are going to be sensitive to different topics. And so the more, the, it's like the more you know, the more tools you have in the tool shed, you know, to, to connect with somebody who you're having a conversation with. So let's say you get to somebody and, um, and we re recognize there's, you know, different, different gospel. Yeah, you're right. Galatians 1 and 9. Yeah, you're right. One of us is in trouble. How do we go about figuring this out? Well, we could look at Joseph Smith's character. Is he a good, is he a good candidate for somebody who we think would uh, restore spiritual truth? And we can look at some issues. He's got polygamy and polyandry. Anyone know the difference between polygamy and polyandry? He does both. What's polyandry? You all probably know polygamy. He had 34 wives, I think. What's polyandry? It's when... Wasn't it like some of the wives were married to other people too? Yeah. So it's the woman is married to two men, right? And they would do this. Um, Joseph Smith had, I think, 11 of his 34-ish wives that we know of um, were already married to other men. And that's problematic because a lot of times you, you get a you get a apologetic from the Mormons. It's like, well, in those days, a lot of women, if they lost their husband, they wouldn't have the means to be provided for, and so it was kind of an act of grace to kind of take them in, and, and you're like, really, because 11 of the 30s, like a third of the women were already married to other men, and he took them for his own anyway. That's, that should raise some red flags. Um, he had a history of magic, cult of magic. Uh, there's a lot that you can go into on that. Uh, he was charged with um, bank fraud, uh, treason. He had all kinds of interesting um, court things. Gunfighting, I just, I like that one. He, he shot at people, hit them. Uh, when he died, he was in a gunfight. They like to talk about it as a martyrdom, uh, but if you go to the Joseph History Museum and you walk through, uh, they have his gun there. And you're like, what, what does a martyr need with a, with a gun? Um, you know, not a lot of Christian martyrs went down, you know, sh uh, shooting or I don't know, whatever. Okay. So some historical issues. I'm not going to focus on those today. You've got issues with him changing revelations. So in 1833, he published the Book of Commandments. Uh, one of the things that he said there in the Book of Commandments 4.2, he says um, that the book of bringing forth the Book of Mormon is the only gift that God would give him. And, he should, and that he would not pretend to any other gift. And... Things changed for him in the, in the months and years after that. He was presented with opportunities to um, translate Egyptian material and make that into the Pearl of Great Price. So he started, uh, it's a whole other story, but he started going into that. And so all of a sudden in 1835, they're going to republish the Book of Commandments. You can't say it's the only gift anymore because he's claiming that God's doing more stuff. And so he changes it to the first gift. So you can see that. Um, and these are things that you can buy. Uh, I have a copy of, at home. Um, at, you can buy a Siegel book or Desert book. They'll have the 1833 replica that you can own and have. You can have 1835 one or today's one. And you can show people the, the, uh, the change. And uh, it changes from the, from the only gift to the first gift. Again, to accommodate more things that he's producing for people. That should be a problem. In fact, this is one of the... Uh, one of the reasons why David Whitmer, who was one of his apostles, wanted to leave and, and ended up rejecting Joseph Smith as a prophet. He still believed in the Book of Mormon, but he rejects Joseph Smith as a prophet. 
And this is one of the things that he cites. He says, I was there in the beginning. You said this. Now you say this. That's a problem for me. Right? Which one is it? That's a problem. Um, failed translations. So he, we can see uh, that the changes he makes to the Bible are uh, nowhere witnessed in any textual, revel, uh, uh, any textual transmission, in any fragment. There's zero witnesses for anything he's ever said the Bible needs to change about. Book of Abraham is a whole other story. How many of you guys have looked into the issues with the Book of Abraham? Okay, I'm not going to go into that then. Um, but it's fascinating. And I would say, it's if I was a Mormon, um, that is the thing that would get me out, I think. I don't know, because I'm not a Mormon, never was. But if I was a Mormon and someone showed me the things that he shows, the, the Egyptian papyri, and he numbered them and told you what they mean, and today we have those and um, it's not it has nothing to do with what he said that that should that should I think that would get me out I think I'd be like okay he doesn't know what he's doing um, the Mormon church put out a just real quick this is kind of interesting they put out a gospel topic essay on the book of Abraham that's fascinating to read absolutely fascinating so the Mormon church has been hit with a lot of criticism for a lot of the things we've talked about some of the Paul uh, the the um, polygamous stuff and the there's history on racism and lots of different things that are kind of a, a, some unsavory parts of their history and they produce these little documents these little essays that try to give a faithful spin for Mormons who are being confronted with this kind of stuff and uh, one of the things that they say um, in that piece is they say uh, because that what they're what they're grappling with is they say well there's Exactly zero Egyptologists who will say that what, what Joseph Smith said, the book of Abraham facsimiles mean, um, that that's what it actually means. There's nobody who would hold that, and, and they even say it in there that there's no relationship. And so they have to come up with something else. And so this is their, they say, they say well, um, Joseph Smith's study of the papyri may have led to a revelation about key events and teachings in the life of Abraham. Okay, so that's. That's a different thing. Now they're saying maybe he didn't actually translate anything. Maybe there's no like real relationship between what he wrote it said and what the little picture was because it's Egyptian. It doesn't work. But maybe it was just a revelation about key events. And so we can change our view. We don't need translator anymore. Maybe it's not a literal reading like a conventional translation would be, rather the physical artifacts provided an occasion for meditation, reflection, and revelation. All right, so I remember having a conversation about this with a, a missionary, and I was like, so we were, I had a bag of Doritos with me, and I'm like, so this bag of Doritos, literally they could have put a picture of that right here, where, where that, you know, in your, book, in your book of Abraham, you could have a picture of a, book, of a Doritos package and number all the stuff, and come up with your story of the book of Abraham and the Pearl of Great Price, and you just be like, yeah, absolutely, that would work. Like, that sounds good. It's not really a translation of anything. It's just it's kind of sparked a revelatory experience, and he, he said, yeah, it doesn't have to bear any relationship to the text there. And I just think, gosh, if I was Mormon, I had to, I had to swallow that pill. I think I would just, I think I'd just walk away. I think that's, that's ridiculous. That's not at all what Joseph Smith said he was doing. He said God was showing him by the power, the gift of power of God, what this meant, and all this stuff. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. So I do want to give you guys, though, um, a couple ways that we test a prophet. You're probably familiar with this. What are, what are the ways that we test a prophet? Yeah. You see what they say comes to pass? Okay, that's a great test. This can be my second test. Um, here's the first one. Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 3. This one's interesting because he says here, even if a prophet... Um, gives you a sign or wonder, and let's say that that sign or wonder comes to pass. So this is even a stronger test. Even if somebody is able to give you a prophetic thing that comes true, right? Because anybody could get, could get lucky, right? And so God kind of has this, I still need to protect my people. Even if somebody says something about the future and it comes to pass, I don't want them to get led astray. And so he has this test. If that person says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and serve them, you shall... You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. So what's the test? What are we testing here? Even if, they, even if what they say comes to true, what do we test in them? Yeah. 
Whether they talk about the real God or not. Okay, we, yeah, we test their theology. We make sure that when they talk about God, they're talking about the God of, of Scripture. Right? Huge test. Huge test. Well, um, there's some, I'm not, we don't need to go into all of these, but, you know, uh, Psalm 90 verse 2, um, God is eternal. Right? Um, from eternity to eternity, thou art God. That art, if that's a good King James version for you. Um, James 2, 19, even the demons know there's one God. They shudder, but even the demons know this. Isaiah 45, 5 and 6, um, some of you guys, if you have tabbed Bibles for this kind of stuff, you probably tabbed this. Anyone have that? Uh, Isaiah 45, 5 and 6. You ask the Bible, how many gods are there? Was allowed to tell us. You want to have that? There's a ton of there's a ton of places you could. Uh, I just put in parentheses Isaiah 43 to 46. Just re, you can read those few chapters. It's repetitive how many times God hits people over the head with this. So what does 45, 5, and 6 say? I am the Lord. There is none else. There is no God beside me. I heard it thou, though thou hast not known me. But they may know me from the rising of the sun and from the west, but there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. He's just very emphatic about this. I'm the God, there's none else, there's no one else like me. Right? In fact, in, in some of those other verses, he makes the point, uh, you know, if, 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 if God is, he says there's no God beside me, and he's like, there's none beside me. He says there's none before me, there's none after me. So he kind of like just makes it very clear as you go through Isaiah, like there's just one God. There's no room for another God beside me. There's no room for God before me. There's no room for God after me. This is the God of the Bible who reveals himself, uh, the Shema, like the most key teaching. Anyone know where you find the, the, the Shema in, in the Bible? Anyone know what that is? Deuteronomy 6.4. Yep, Deuteronomy 6.4. Um, so this is the first verse, that, the first words that, that uh, you're supposed to teach a Jewish child, the Shema. First words you're supposed to recite when you wake up if you're a Jewish person. The first words, the last words you recite before you go to bed. It's the last words you recite before uh, you die is the idea. Um, every day. Every day. It's the, the, the cornerstone of Jewish faith. And that cornerstone is connected to monotheism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Uh, and, and, and you should love him and him alone, right, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so, uh, as Jesus says, so... So you've got this idea of this radical monotheism. The Bible will not allow for more gods than one. And so if we're going to, even if we grant Joseph Smith prophetic skills, which you should not grant that, but even if you did, you could just ask, well, did he teach the same God that we find in the Bible? Right? And what's the answer to that? Uh-uh. It doesn't. Now, I know from their side, they're going to say, well, no, because he restored, the Bible has a corrupted view, and I just restored it. I get, I get that they're going to say that. But let's just understand, for clarity's sake, uh, that his view of, the, of, of God is different than the God of the Bible. And um, the reason why this is kind of interesting right now is this has to do a little bit with what, uh, what I've been writing about um, just recently, and, uh, and, and there's a... a publication called Dialogue, which is a um, kind of a, it's called the a Journal of Mormon Thought, and there's a guy who publishes there, a philosopher, whose name is Blake Osler. He, he writes sometimes, uh, he's not an authority of the LDS Church, but he's a thinker, and he recognizes that the, the, the version of God that Joseph Smith um, revealed is philosophically bankrupt, because it's an infinite regress of gods, one on top of another, on infinitum. And it causes all kinds of uh, theological problems and philosophical problems for Mormonism. Um, in fact, I think that view of God, which I would call the traditional view, the view that Joseph Smith taught, um, it, my, it, it, that, that any uh, natural theological argument that you have for the existence of God would also be an argument against Mormon theism of that variety. So what are our use of natural theology? Anyone know what's a, what natural theology is? What are arguments of natural theology? You mean like the 
kalam is, is a natural theological argument. Yeah, it's an argument for God's existence that doesn't require scripture. Design. The design argument. <clears throat> ontological. ontological argument. What? Teleological. Teleological is the design, but you could you could run that through a fine tuning versus uh, kind of a Paley uh, Paley style version of it, um, and then you've got the moral argument, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and there's there's a host of others. The argument from beauty was one that we were just talking about, Gabriel and I, with a friend of ours. Um, all all in the, from consciousness from rationality, you can get a lot of different arguments of natural theology, and every one of those arguments, I think, if if it's a good argument for Christian theism, they also end up being a good argument against Mormon theism. When you run it through the traditional view, because the, because what it, the kind of God that those natural theological arguments give you is a robust God who is himself the grounding or cause of all things, or who is the grounding of moral um, values and duties. Uh, but the God for Mormonism that Joseph Smith taught is none of that. He's just another cog in the wheel uh, into an infinite chain that goes on and on forever that seems to have no beginning point. And so the Kalam cannot help him, but not only can Kalam cosmological argument not help him, but if it's a good argument, it also undercuts Mormon theism uh, uh, as, as a whole. Same with the moral argument and, and a bunch of other, all the other ones, I think, actually. And so what Blake Osler has done is he's tried to redefine Mormon theism in, into a more philosophical, more philosophically protected kind of theism that he calls um, monarcho-theism, or kingship monotheism. And so what, uh, what my article um, that I just wrote is trying to do is persuade intellectual Mormons that that doesn't work. That if you're going to be faithful to Joseph Smith, um, that Joseph Smith's teaching on God is incompatible with this philosophical view of God called kingship monotheism, where he's trying to get the God that you need in order to have natural theology. Um, he's trying to get, like Osler wants a first cause of everything. He wants that to be God. He wants a head God who's over all the rest of them. And, he's try and he tries to wrestle with some of Joseph Smith's teaching. And, uh, and, and show that it's consistent. So what I do is just the opposite. Is I walk through specifically these two um, sermons that Smith gave, the King Follett Discourse and, uh, what he called, and what's called the Sermon in the Grove. These are two of the more important teachings of Joseph Smith because they come right at the end of his life. This is more mature teaching. It's kind of the, he kind of been building and growing and developing his prophetic um, you know, skill or whatever it is, I don't know, and it's been developing and in, in these sermons he kind of lays out the full kind of weight of where his theology is headed. And so he gives, the King Follett Discourse is named after a guy who um, had died and he's giving a funeral sermon, but he's giving that funeral sermon, not like in a graveside scenario, but at a general conference with some 20,000 people listening. This is a huge event. This is kind of a monumental uh, sermon that Joseph Smith gives, maybe the most important sermon he ever did, and uh, it's called the King Follett Discourse. Uh, it's at their April 1844 General Conference, and then later, uh, just a few months later, in June of 1844, he had gotten some backlash because of that sermon that he gave. So he gave that sermon. Some people left the church after that. Um, in fact, William Law, who was one of his apostles, uh, left the church and wrote a newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor. And part of what the Nauvoo Expositor exposed uh, was his polygamy and, and, uh, and, the, and William Law and, and a group of followers distaste in this trajectory of, of a plurality of gods, one of the things that they highlight. And so Joseph Smith doesn't back away from that and instead in his, the last sermon he ever gave before, before he was killed, June 16th, he, he doesn't retract or, or backtrack at all, but he actually advances things even further. So. And so let me just give you a couple pieces of, uh, just a, a taste of some of what he says in these sermons. It would it, be fun to go and, and read them. You can, you can find them in Mormon bookstores or Mormon um, sources or a, lot, a variety of places. But it is King Fallout Discourse. He says, it is necessary that we should understand the character and being of God and how he came to be so. 
For I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil that you may see. So he's telling people, maybe you grew up with a view of God that he was God from all eternity. He says, I'm going to show you that that's wrong. And that's not how God actually is. He says, here then is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God. And you've got to learn how to be gods yourselves, to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you, namely by going from one small degree to another, from a small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, exaltation to exalt exaltation, until you attain to the resurrection of the dead and are able to dwell in everlasting burnings and to sit in glory as do those who sit enthroned in everlasting power. So you've got to learn to be gods the same as all gods have done before. So he's starting to lay out this view that, um, uh, that is nicely summarized by Lorenzo Snow. He's got that famous couplet, it's called that poetic kind of way of putting this. Anyone familiar with that? Lorenzo Snow couplet? How does it go? Do you know? As man is, God once was. As God is, man may be. Yeah, sharp. I love it. Yeah, exactly. So that's Lorenzo Snow, who later became prophet of the church. He wrote and um, um, uh, published that during Smith's lifetime, and Smith affirmed it. He said, that's, that's good theology. You nailed it, Lorenzo. Um, and, then, and then Snow was later went on to be prophet and all that. Kind of sum, sums up this view that God was once just a human living his life on some other place just like you. And he passed his test qualified for exaltation. Um, in the Sermon on the Grove, he says things like, the Holy Ghost is yet a spiritual body and is waiting to take to himself a body as the Savior did or as God did or the gods before them took bodies. So there's sort of this process of needing to get embodied, go through mortality testing in order to be exalted to the highest levels of Godhood. Intelligences exist one above another and there's no end to it. This is what he thought. God is an intelligence. There's some other intelligences. There's more above him. And it goes on. There's no end to it. The head gods organize the heavens or the earth and the heavens. The head gods, it's, a, it's always a plurality for, for Joseph Smith. And this is what Blake Osler kind of misses is J, uh, Blake Osler wants there to be a head god because that would give us a little bit more of a, would give Mormonism a little bit more of a philosophically defensible view. But that's just not what Joseph Smith says. He says there's, even at the beginning of creation, there's the, the head gods. It's always plural. And, and Joseph Smith makes that claim. It's plural all the way through, he says. And so there's just gods above another. How many? I, I don't know. It just goes on. Yeah. Why is an infinite regress of gods a problem, philosophically? Yeah. Where did the first one come from? What's that? Where did the first one come from? So you, you need another one. And then you got to get the one before that, and you got to get the one, and then, yeah, and you, if you don't have a starting point, you can never get the, you know, it's like that, it's like the idea, if I ask one of you for, um, you know, five bucks, hey, could you give me five bucks? And you're like, yeah, I'm going to give you five dollars, let me just ask her for, and then you ask her, and she says, yeah, you can have five bucks, but i got to ask her, and then and it kind of goes, and when do I ever get five bucks? If that chain keeps going, when do I only get the five dollars if it ever stops at someone who just has it to give without needing to get it from someone else? So if God always, if our, if God's always need to get their existence from someone else, when does God ever actually come to exist? Only if you can get to one who has existence to give and doesn't need to get it from anywhere else. But their view doesn't have that. This is just infinite chain, and that's a that's a that's a big issue. So so the first test, Deuteronomy thirteen teaches us um, that even, even if we just accept for the sake of argument that Joseph Smith said some correct things prophetically, um, we, sh we should still reject him as a prophet because he doesn't pass the theological test. His view of God is foreign to, uh, to the God of the Bible. But, but, but we shouldn't accept the fact that Joseph Smith is a good prophet anyway. There are lots of ways to show that Joseph Smith is not a prophet um, and this comes to the second major test that we ought to think about, and I'm sure you guys have looked at this before, but Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22. Lauren, before we get into that, can we camp a little more yeah. on Osler? Sure. Can you explain why he arrives at the position he does when it seems pretty obvious from the human rights sermon that God okay. became God? What does Osler do? Yeah, and also, that's a good Can you talk about... Does Oslo have our God? 
No, he still doesn't have our God. And, in fact, at the end of the day, his view of God is still, uh, is still not the God of, of natural theology and is still refuted by all the arguments for natural theology really? anyway. So he doesn't actually get out of the quandary that he thinks he does um, because he still believes – he wants to get rid of the infinity of God's bit. But he still believes that God himself is subject to eternal laws. And the way that his divinity grows or uh, the way that his divinity is expressed is in harmony with eternal laws and principles and priesthoods that exist outside of God. So there's still these external things to him that he has to lean on in order to get divinity. And, uh, and he could actually lose them. He thinks that God could actually lose those things uh, that, he, that he could um, – for a variety of reasons, lose his divinity. To get divinity? So yeah, God so hasn't always been God? He, he has this developing idea that though he was divine, in the same way that he believes that Jesus Christ was divine before he came here, but he's even more divine later, after the, after the mortal existence. So he actually grows in divinity and power and all of this. He grows still today as we are exalted his, his kingdom is enlarged, and that's this enlargement process. That takes going through mortality. But he believes that it's possible for God to have failed the test in mortality and, um, and then been demoted and knocked out of divinity. Uh, or he believes that there needs to be someone to exalt him, and so it's possible that those other gods could have just failed to do so, and he could have been stuck without ever being exalted. So it's, a, it's still not the kind of God that we serve who is from everlasting to everlasting, God enthroned forever, and everything else. Right? It's a totally different idea. But he just wants to avoid this infinite regress. And the way that he's doing that, even though, like I showed you from the King Follow Discourse and from the Sermon on the Grove, or Sermon in the Grove, the way that he tries to get around it is by amending the Sermon on the, the, the King Follow Discourse. And by amending the Sermon in the Grove. And he does that because there are several different people who are recording that sermon at the same time. Uh, when you read the sermon today, the King Follett Discourse, you're going to read an amalgamated ver version. That is one that, that other, uh, Wilfred Woodruff and um, Thomas Clayton, they took all the available records from that sermon, which is, is probably the most heard sermon of any sermon Justice with ever gave. We have the most um, accounts of that sermon from any other sermon he gave, so it's not that hard, not that much is in doubt, but he'll just take that and he'll kind of try to grab a hold of some place where there's a difference in what one person shorthanded recorded from what another person shorthanded recorded, and he'll try to argue and change what, what he thinks Joseph Smith said in order to fit his thing. And so um, one of the things that, I've, that I do is um, walk through the changes that he uh, calls for and try to show that they're baseless, that, they, that, um, that that's a, a, a not the right textual critic kind of way to assess what Mr. Smith actually said. So that's one of the things that he does. Do all the versions state that God became God? Yeah, so, so this view right here, uh, let me show you this one, for example. Um, can you follow discourse? Um, when he says, I will refute that idea, there's um, one of the guys, one of the people who record it, it's all shorthand, so they're not giving you full sentences, right? He, what he says is, you have, we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. And then he says, if I will refute it. And so Austin says, if I will refute it. Justice Smith doesn't refute it. He just says, if I will refute it. So, so he tries to find these little wiggle rooms. And so then what I do is I walk through all of the other accounts and show, no, there's actually a lot of evidence for him um, willfully showing that he is refuting this. And not only that, but the one that says, if I will refute it, if you read on to his next line, he says things that, that, that understand that what he's meaning or thinking about when he's writing that is see if I, uh, uh, see if I refute it or, or, or watch me refute it. So it is affirmed even though the way he wrote it is less 
elegant or clean or obvious, but when you read his fuller account, you see that what he says is actually meaning the same thing as the rest of them mean when, when he says it. So he tries little tricks and things like that. He, he uh, doesn't look at the ones that he cherry picks. He doesn't look at the ones that hurt his view and he only highlights the ambiguity of one and elevates that above the others, which is a terrible, you don't take the, you know, the less clear and then use that to trump the more clear ones, right? That's just textual uh, interpretation 101. You take the more clear and allow that to interpret uh, the less clear text. And uh, he, he doesn't do that either. Is there a hand back there? So, yeah. Um, so when you, when you look up under like the histories of the church, would they consider that just thoughts? Because doesn't that, isn't that what it's, where it says, the first principle of the gospel? Yeah. Is it most certainly that the character of God to know that he was yeah. once a man like us? Yeah, they don't, they don't deny what Joseph Smith is teaching here. Th that's why, what, what I'll call the traditional view. It's the view that most Mormons have in their head. It's the view that's taught in the war. It's the view that all their prophets and apostles have taught. The, Blake Osler is an aberration, but he's a philosophically minded one. He's trying to avoid an infinite regress and get to a God that he thinks is more philosophically defensible, even though I think he's, his, product is, his project is a failure anyway, even if successful in his emendations. But if he's successful, then Mormonism fails. It would still be, it would still be a problem, yeah. But I think that even his attempt, um, I think that a lot of Mormons, they sort of use it, sort of a, oh no, Osler figured it out. Intellectually, like intellectually minded philosophical ones. I don't know, I think Osler's view is more philosophically safe. Not actually having like walked through the implications of it, but they just sort of will punt to, oh no, mo uh, monarcho theism doesn't fall into the same traps. I think it still doesn't get them everything that they need, but what I wanna do is even kind of preempt that by saying, um, actually his view is not compatible with Joseph Smith. So that's, you know, uh, just one of the things. So is his God truly infinite? always been God, but yet he's improving God like a process theology or he's something? He's not, like he's not, a, he's not infinite in any real sense. Not like what he's you were right dependent on eternal laws and principles. Yeah, still dependent. Absolutely. Because that's one part that's super clear <laughs> that he can't fudge on. There's not a lot of wiggle room there because that's like in the standard works and stuff. So he's kind of stuck with this idea of of God, you know, having these eternal principles that are outside of him. And the priesthood, not something he controls, it's something he inherits. But where, but they ask the question, where does that come from? Yeah. So it's not a necessary God. Um, um, maybe he might want, nature. he might want it to be, yeah, it's going to be a different nature, but he might want it to, he might even well say, I think he's, I think he's a necessary being. It's just that there's all kinds of other necessary stuff that he's dependent on for his, you know, properties of divinity or whatever. So we might be able to use the Leibnizian argument for the archaeological argument. Um, so contingent and, and, well, but, yeah, um, but the intelligences and stuff, yeah, they could, a Mormon could do that anyway with, uh, any Mormon, like Osler or otherwise, thinks that that matter is eternal. So they're, they're eternal materialists. So that doesn't change for Osler or for a traditional. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me give a couple examples. Anyone know of a false prophecy of Joseph Smith that you could use to help get to that place where you, when you have a difference and you recognize and we're weighing Joseph Smith, um, where, what can we show, what can we help them, um, them see? I'm going to ask a student first. I got a student hand right here. Um, so He's had actually like a couple, but um, one of them is like the Civil War prophecy. Okay, yeah, that's a great one. Civil War prophecy is Dark and Cones 87. Um, yeah, so this is an interesting one because he correctly identifies that the, that the Civil War, which he died in the 40s, 1840s, right? Civil War starts in the 1860s. This is 20 years after he's after he dies, the Civil War starts, right? But he, he says it's gonna start in South Carolina. And Mormons say, well, you know, you read history, history book, first shots are fired in South Carolina. So Joseph Smith must be a prophet. Okay, so what's the problem with that? They said that like all nations yeah. would be emerged, like, immersed in this war. 
He says it's going to be all poured out. This war is going to be poured out on all nations, beginning in that place. Um, not only that, but what else does he say? He says Great Britain is going to come in and get involved. And, uh, and, then, um, and then they shall also call upon other nations. And like you said, war shall be poured out on all nations. And so when you get a prophecy like this, what, what's a, here's a great question to ask. Ready? Did that happen? It's a great question. Did that happen? <laughs> what is the Mormon going to say? No, that didn't happen. Ah, so what did Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22 tell us? We didn't read that one, did we? Second test of a prophet. Oops. The prophet who presumes to speak a word of my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass... Uh, and, or does not happen that word the Lord has not spoken the prophet has spoken presumptuously and you need not be afraid of him you don't have to heed his words okay so so uh, that's a, so the question did it happen that's just then you go back to this and that should be the end of it what else another false prophecy anyone else you know another one yeah the temple building. oh that's my favorite one the temple being built. You're right. Doctrine and, Doctrine and Covenants 84. Now, the great thing about the ones that we're talking about right now are that they are in their standard works. You don't have to go to get some external source, or some anti-Mormon thing that they're going to call anti-Mormon. You can just open up their scriptures, right? Doctrine and Covenants 84. He says here that there's going to be a, uh, a temple that would be built um, in Missouri um, where the one that was dedicated by the hand of Joseph Smith, Jr., so Joseph Smith Jr. dedicated a particular place. He stood there. They had the cornerstone. He said, this is the, where the temple will be built. Um, they marked it with this uh, plaque. You see this plaque over here. And what do you notice right here? It's an empty field. Empty field. In fact, he said, this is why this one's so important here. He says that. The temple shall be created. I'm sorry about these weird letters. This is I just copied and pasted this from LDS.org, and they have notes that are associated with some of these, and so it, they, you know, just disregard those little letters there. But he says the temple shall be uh, shall be reared in what? This generation. this generation. Is there anybody living today who was living in Joseph Smith's time? Zero people. <laughs> yeah. um, what's interesting about this one is if you have the time and, and you want to spend some time, this is one of the best ones to do because the Mormons held on to this prophecy, held on to it. Anyone know why it didn't come to pass? Why didn't this work? By they the way? had to go to Utah. What? They had to come here. They, they had to leave Missouri yeah. by executive order, not exactly the most savory part of American history, but the governor of Missouri kicked the LDS people um, out of Missouri and said, if you don't leave, we'll kill you and take your property. So they left. There was some fighting. There was all kinds of stuff involved with that. But they, they left. Now, that seems like a small view of God. If God can be thwarted and his prophecies can be thwarted by a governor, something. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's a smaller view of God. But anyway, the reason, again, this one uh, is a false prophecy and, and you can go to that temple lot today. They don't own the property anymore. There's a group called the Temple Lot uh, Mormons who who have the deed to that to that land. And Mormon Church hasn't built the temple there. And uh, generations past, that's a, that's a false prophecy. Anyone know of another one? I don't remember the guy's name, but he said one guy would oh, yeah. leave for a, oh, yeah. Yeah, um, like a mission trip, but the guy died before it actually happened. Dr. Cummins were 14, David Patton, he was an apostle, and Joseph Smith wanted his apostles to be more missionary, more missionaries. And so he told David Patton to settle up his business 
and uh, that he may perform a mission next spring in company with others, even 12 including himself, to testify my name and bear glad tidings to the world. So again, a great question to ask when you open this one up with your friend and you're trying to say, should we, you know, the gospel, if it's a different gospel, one of us is a curse, like we better make sure we know which authority source is, is the right stream of authority. Let's test Joseph Smith, right? Um, let's look at his prophetic thing, Dr. Cummins 114, and we ask that question, did it happen? <coughs> What do you think they'll say? Have you tried this one with someone? What do they say? In the spirit world. Oh, he, he, he did go on a mission trip, but he went on it in, on it in, a, in a spiritual, because he died before next spring. See, so he gives a time, next spring. Next spring ha comes, David Patton already died, so he doesn't go on that mission trip. Looks like a false prophecy. Well, they kind of throw this little, wow, he went to the, on a mission in the spirit realm. What's the problem with that? A, it's unknowable. What else? Did the other 12 go with him? Notice this. In company with others. Which others? Even 12 including himself. That the 12 apostles were all being sent by Joseph Smith. So he was going to go, like you said, in company with those others. He was going to be present with them. Okay, question to ask. Again, did it happen? Didn't happen. All right. What else? Any other false prophecies you guys know of that are that are easy to easy to hit up, uh, easy to hit? Um, from in the, the Toronto one, that one is a good one, but it's not in their in their scripture. So um, that one is in the history of the church. So it's in, a, in you can find it in a reliable source that they'll accept, but it's not easy out on the streets all the time because you don't probably have it in their Book of Mormon or something like that. But he, he does claim, he, tell, he sends people to sell the copyright of the Book of Mormon to some folks in Toronto claiming that when they get there, they'll get out of debt by selling it and they come back empty the end. Um, Doctor and Covenants uh, 111, um, he again was running into problems with money. He got in trouble with bank fraud. Uh, he needed to raise money. He sends his apostles to Massachusetts, to Salem, Massachusetts. And he tells them that when they get there, God is going to bless that um, and, uh, and uh, he says that they're going to, he's going to give the city into your hands. You'll have power over of it. Uh, they will receive, he says, its wealth pertaining to gold and silver shall be yours. Um, they will inquire dil diligently concerning the more ancient inhabitants, founders of the city, uh, for there are tre more treasures than one for you in this city. Don't worry about the debts. God's going to provide. You'll get over there. What's the problem with this one? What should we ask? Did it happen? Does, does the, the ninth sentence, does that mean they're just going to get a job? Did it mean what? This place you may be obtained by hire. What does that mean? Um, yeah, you, you, you can get there. You can, yeah, I think it just means you can, okay, we're, we're, you'll find yeah. it. We'll get somebody, we'll get over there. Yeah, we'll get you over there. Okay. Uh, inquire diligently concerning the more ancient inhabitants. You'll travel there. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, the, yeah so they did travel. They actually don't, they do go. Yeah. They go to, they go to Salem. Uh, but did they get a bunch of wealth? Did they get treasure? Did they get gold and silver when they got there and bring it back? Zero. Did it happen? No. What, what did happen when they got there? They looked around and asked people and came back and handed <laughs> should be a sign, right? It is a sign. Deuteronomy 18 tells you this is a sign. Don't follow this man. They probably went there without faith. First <laughs> um, um, Nephi 13, the whole chapter of 1 Nephi 13 is uh, an important one. This is what they, uh, what they say would happen. Again, a historical claim 
that in Joseph Smith's time was untestable. He claims that the, the Bible would be corrupted, that specifically the book of the Jews, which would be the Old Testament, would be corrupted after the time of Jesus and the apostles. So Jesus and the apostles are going to die, the Bible is going to be corrupted. Um, and, and so, you know, in Joseph Smith's day, let's say right here, if you're 1830, Oldest, oldest Old Testament text that we have in Hebrew were from about 1,080. Okay? And so that led to some questions. You know, well, what happened to this whole period of time before that text? Could the Bible have been um, you know, corrupted during that time? Well, we, couldn't, we, we had Jesus' words that said, you know, my words will never um, fail. You had the Bible in, in Isaiah it's 40 verse 8 where he says, you know, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. So we have some like scripture to hold on to that says it hadn't been corrupted. But in terms of like evidence, we didn't have anything, right? So what changed in the 40s? What changed with this view? What's that? The Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead sea Scrolls. So in, the, in 1947, we discover the Dead Sea Scrolls, which on the most conservative estimate, you've got a bunch of Old Testament Hebrew texts that predate Jesus by at least 100 years, a lot of it even longer than that. But so that what that means is now in 1947, we can look all the way back to the Hebrew texts that Jesus and the apostles would have used that would have been around for 100 years prior to them even. And we can look at the Hebrew text from that point. And when we, you know, when we do that, we're able to Look at even the ones that we have today. We're able to look at the ones that were from that 1000 AD period, and we're able to see that they reflect those same Hebrew texts that date back. And so, what that shows us is that that prophecy that Joseph Smith made up and put on the mouths of people in Nephi, 1 Nephi 13, that the Bible would be corrupted and changed after the time of Jesus and the apostles, that that didn't bear out. That in fact, when we discover texts that predate Jesus and the apostles, it's the same Hebrew texts that we uh, would use today. And so um, that prophecy didn't, doesn't work either. Uh, you'd mentioned this other one, this Toronto thing. You mentioned um, you know, where you could find that history of the church. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This one actually is different. These are two different ones. I forgot. You also have him saying that if you go fast forward 85 years um, to where he would be 85 years old, Jesus would come by him. So we didn't have it. Got a few things. A few things wrong. Okay, what's your guys' um, time? How much time do I have right now? Are we done? Well, we should probably, I mean, if we can keep going, but we might should take a five-minute stretch break or something. Okay. And I'd love to take some questions, too. But I have um, another thing to do if, uh, if there's time. So at 11.30, we're scheduled to eat. Okay. So, so why, don't we, why don't we take a couple minutes Q&A and then break at, in, at 11.30? And okay. then figure out whatever you want to do after that. It's fine. Okay. So any, it, are there any questions that you guys have uh, about some of what we have about today? So far. Is it, is it possible that we can eat and then do Q&A or no? Or are we, is that mess up our time? I mean... Yeah, I'm fine with. Uh, We're supposed to leave here for Temple Square at 12:30. Um, I'm cool with the, the dusting that if you want to. So we need to leave roughly in an hour to have the time to be at Temple Square. Um, can we do Q and A while we eat? All right. Do you want us to eat out there or? Okay. All right, let's take a break and grab our lunches and we'll do Q&A. Yeah.